And so the Battle of Shiloh came to an end. Um, about 24,000 casualties, maybe a few more. Um, now, I want to warn you a little bit about numbers in the uh, Civil War or any war that's not uh, before the 20th century. Um, these numbers are a little loose. Um, people had to come up, you know, if you were in charge of a unit, you had to come up with a number for your your uh, superiors. And so people would say, well, we lost 121 people. Maybe, you know, and oftentimes people would be counted as uh, missing or even wounded. And uh, what they really had done was they just had enough of the battle and walked, uh, walked away and uh, came back several days later and in the confusion, nobody noticed. Um, so these numbers are just really, really funky numbers. And um, we're recounting them. We originally said that there were 600,000 casualties in the civil or deaths in the Civil War. Um, now, in the recount, we're up over 700,000 and we're still counting. Um, so we don't really, really know um, exactly uh, how many died. And now, there was in Europe, the battle that ended uh, Napoleon's uh, reign, uh, the Battle of Waterloo, which, as you can imagine, was probably just an insanely bloody battle. Um, Shiloh was as bad as Waterloo. This is just amazing. Um, and of course, then began to have the fame of Waterloo. But it was the first really modern battle in terms of kill power. Um, and um, it's, it's a, it's, it's, Shiloh stands out. It's an important battle. Um, and what made it so bloody? I mean, these were two armies. These were not armies in the Napoleonic War where you had uh, uh, well experienced soldiers and well experienced officers. Uh, you know, these guys were amateurs. Um, very, even the even the commanders had uh, seen only a little bit of battle. Um, Grant, for instance, had been in the Mexican War, but not in a very high position. Um, and what did it was the fact that a, in those days, the, the practical killing range of a rifle was 400 yards. Back in the Revolution, most people had muskets. Practical range of a musket, killing range of a musket was about 40 yards. Um, so if you're going to charge a position, when pit positions were charged in Shiloh, uh, with your bayonet out and all that stuff, um, you weren't going to make it. If you can be shot at 400 yards, you can be shot at 300 yards and 200 yards, and your chance of actually making it to your object is really low. Uh, and there'll be some, some terrific casualty rates later on in the war as, as uh, soldiers get used to killing uh, at a longer range. Um, there was one particular charge uh, which ended up with 7,000 deaths in about 10 minutes, or 7,000 casualties within about 10 minutes. So uh, the killing range is really something. The shock of all this death in the United States, uh, in both, both countries, was a staggering. In those days, it would not be unusual for a town of 4,000 people to have five newspapers. Well, the newspapers in those days printed the entire casualty list. Um, and so you would have newspapers, which were usually, you know, four pages, suddenly have to put in a bunch of extra pages uh, in order to list 24,000 killed. Um, and so the end, or 24,000 injured and killed. Uh, and so the end result was that people literally were staggered by what they saw in front of them. It's inconceivable uh, to look at a list that long. And yet that's what happened. And so the nation, it would not be wrong to say the nation reeled from Shiloh. Shiloh, more people were killed and injured in Shiloh than in the American Revolution, the Mexican War, the War of 1812 combined. So we have something that frankly, the world had never seen before happen in April of 1862. Um, Shiloh settled nothing. The, um, you know, the, technically it's a Union victory. The Confederates had to withdraw on the second day because they simply didn't have enough troops. Um, well, they don't withdraw that far. They withdraw down to a town called Corinth, Mississippi. And then um, the, um, you know, the Union Army is so badly shot up that they can't, it takes them a long time to get uh, close to the Confederates again. Um, Grant, 
um, kind of gets blamed, I think, and to some degree, rightfully so, uh, for Shiloh. Uh, he shouldn't also get credit for the for the eventual victory because he, he was a pretty sturdy person uh, while things were going bad. Um, but he, his troops could have been more on guard. Um, a guy by the name of Halleck takes over. Halleck is a Grant superior, but uh, Halleck is a he's a textbook general. Uh, he's great on t on the uh, technical aspects. Doesn't know a damn thing about uh, fighting. Uh, certainly has no gut for it. Uh, and you know you've got to you've got to have the guts uh, to send men to their death. It's uh, it's one thing to be told to go to death. It's something else to order somebody to their death. Now, Halleck didn't have it, and so it took a long time to take that beat up army and get close to the Confederates again. Meanwhile, back east, um, we have three rather remarkable campaigns. Uh, the Valley Campaign under Stonewall Jackson um, was, uh, was a campaign. Jackson had a small number of troops. Uh, he um, started out with 4,000 troops and he ended up with um, a little bit over 10,000 troops. So troops, but um, the geography favored the South, and I've told you that before, that, that all the valleys and um, rivers and what helped you helped an invasion of the North, it didn't help an invasion of the South. Um, and so Jackson draws to him with a small army. Uh, in fact, this, art, this campaign is still studied in military colleges as to how a small army can essentially disrupt a much larger army. Um, and so Jackson moves in a threatening direction toward Washington and Harrisburg and places like that, um, draws to him 50,000 troops, uh, and those 50,000 troops aren't fighting any other place. They're chasing Jackson, um, who is a kind of a will of the wisp, um, and never quite in touch with him. He, uh, Jackson's going to fight six or seven battles. He's going to lose one, the very first one, and the rest he's going to win. Um, and at the same time, he picks time and places to have these fights and um, thoroughly confuses um, and uh, injures the North. Um, and then, um, you know, and so those 50,000 troops, the Northern troops, have been put out of, out of uh, condition by the fact that uh, Jackson's 10,000 or so troops just simply outmaneuvered him. Yeah, and um, down near Richmond, uh, General McClellan, whom we've talked about before, General McClellan took a um, uh, bunch of troops uh, down the Chesapeake Bay, about 105,000, maybe, who knows. Um, warn you about those numbers again. And landed there, down near Jamestown, which is where, the, um, where of course, Cornwallis surrendered to Washington. Um, uh, McClellan, should never have been left on a battlefield, despite the fact that he had about 30,000 troops, about uh, a third again, uh, or half again, as many troops as uh, his opponent, Joe Johnston. Um, McClellan manages to bungle this and only slowly inches his way up toward Richmond. He, Johnston should have been brushed to one side and the war finished, or at least close to finished. Didn't happen that way. But eventually, McClellan did get close to Richmond. Uh, it took him a long time, uh, and he lost a lot of troops doing it. Uh, he was so close that he could hear the church bells in uh, Richmond ringing. And then something odd happens. Johnston, in the Battle of Seven Pines or Fair Oaks, um, Johnston gets badly wounded. Uh, a shell fragment hits him in the head and the shoulder, and he's out of uh, commission for many months. Um, recovering. Um, Jefferson Davis, who not too surprisingly was right on the spot, um, first picks uh, one nearby general to finish off the battle and then turns to his military assistant, a fellow by the name of Robert E. Lee. Lee was not trained and not a trained infantryman. He was trained in engineering. Now, but he had seen a lot of combat in the Mexican War. In fact, you could make quite a case that next to Winfield Scott, he was the best general in the Mexican War, um, or best uh, commander in the Mexican War. Uh, Lee leaves uh, Richmond uncovered. Um, that is, instead of blocking McClellan, he disappears. He's headed north. 
Uh, and the next thing McClellan knows is, is Lee and his troops have exploded on McClellan's northern flank, his, his right flank in this instance. McClellan's right flank should have been utterly destroyed. Lee's battle plans were excellent. His strategy was wonderful. His commanders were inexperienced. They're not, they weren't ready for the job. They're, they're not bad commanders. They just don't have the experience at this point. Um, and as a result, Lee's battle plans, and Lee was quite frustrated by this, Lee's battle plans were com completely uh, disrupted by the fact that his, his uh, commanders didn't know what they were doing and they couldn't coordinate with each other. And then oddly enough, Jackson of all people left Lee down and Jackson had marched from, uh, down from the Shenandoah Valley very quickly. Um, and um, frankly, he was exhausted. Uh, his orders were not precise and clear as they often were. Uh, his, um, his ability to get his officers to execute his orders were uh, slack because he was not, he was out to lunch to be truthful with you. Um, and the end result was that uh, nothing would write for Lee. Now he's going to lose all but one of these battles. Now he's going to win the campaign uh, because he understood how McClellan worked and he, he talked McClellan into withdrawing down to the James River where he's pretty much tucked away in a hole. Um, but um, Jackson, the failure of Jackson made quite a difference and, and, and undoubtedly just changed the course of the war. At one place, a place called White Oak Swamp, Jackson had a chance to do what's cross, called crossing the T. That is, you have a, troops moving in this direction, and then the attacking force comes across like this and slices you in half. You don't want to have your T crossed in military affairs. A uh, bad thing. Um, and Jackson had a perfect chance to do it, but he fell asleep with a biscuit in his teeth, uh, leaning up against a tree. Uh, and they couldn't wake him. And as a result, that chance to destroy that part of the Union Army went away. And it ends up with a lot of casualties because uh, of Lee's uh, officers and experience, um, and frankly, Jackson's uh, complete out to luncheonness. Um, and um, a lot of people are going to die because of this. Uh, and so we come to the end of the seven days. Uh, and the end of the Peninsula Campaign and the Valley Campaign, a really remarkable period uh, in American military history. But still, nothing's been settled. And McClellan's on the James River, Lee's north of him, and both sides have got to figure out what they're going to do next, okay? So take care, everybody stay healthy, and I'll see you um, in just a bit. <laughs>